We're here with Travis Kister at the Howe Farmsworth Farm Day. Travis has his own YouTube channel called The Rest of the Story, where people get to see other happenings and things that are going on here at the farm in Wisconsin. Uh, Travis, thanks a lot for spending a little time with us. Can yeah, you tell no us a little bit about your channel? Well, as you say, my channel is The Rest of the Story. Uh, it's independent from how farms work, while it uh, also kind of plays into it because, well, most people are aware of my channel, my brother's channel. It's the high quality. It, it's it's a really good quality stuff. But the problem is, is that it doesn't necessarily show the the background of what it's taking to get to where Ryan's videos are and what's going on. Um, this is my channel is a lot more down to earth, a lot more you know eye level, I guess. Um, you really don't get a level of a, a different level of the farm that maybe isn't shown on the other channel. So I, it seems to be going very well. People really seem to appreciate it, especially after all the positive feedback I got today from it. So I mean, it's, at least the channel is still growing. It's better than going sideways. So. No, I, I enjoy watching it and seeing all the equipment here on the farm and you just kind of get up and go and yeah. do your work. I don't know. I'll, it's fun. If it wasn't fun, there's really not much point in doing it. So That plays a lot into it too if you're Certainly. Just doing it just to say that you do it. Well, I guess we're, you've been doing tractor rides today here on the, the farm day, and I, I wanted to maybe just take a tour around the farm here like the other people did and kind of see some of the nice scenery out in these uh, rolling hills. All right. All right. Well, we'll climb up here in the 8235R. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no problem. Amazing how dusty these things get. Just driving up and down the field roads. This thing was all pressure off. Yeah, it's just definitely that, that time of year. The only downside to them, we gotta let them warm up. This is a 4640 more just get in it and go? Absolutely. Even the 7600 is. Mm -hmm. And to be quite honest, even that uh, 6135E, it's straightforward. Just put it in gear and run. And the crops really took off here in just the last few days. That last rain shower that we hit that we were so worried about with everything being too muddy to even take tractor rides today, um, really perked up the soybeans. Um, you can tell that they're a lot, they're filled out, they're bushed out more, even a darker green than what they were just a handful of days ago. So when do you, uh, is it you typically plant these late April, early May, is that? Um, directly after corn. Uh, we're not the type to plant soybeans before corn, although we've heard a lot of people that have tried doing so. Uh, we go through and we plant our corn probably starting up the last week of April. And as soon as we're done planting corn, uh, this year for instance, we were done planting corn by noon on was it the 7th of May. And by one o'clock of the same day, we were putting soybeans in the ground. And you use your 12 row Max the 1760 for both crops? Or? Yep. Um, a lot of people ask why we don't drill our beans in. I know a lot of the different farms you follow do. Um, we just found that it works better for us that when you're running them through a planter like that, you're getting a, a better control of your depth and also the population you're aiming for. Do you, you like the 30 inches, I guess, over the 15s then? Um, to be completely honest with you, I've never really had a chance to experiment with the 15 inch beans. Um, we did a little bit back in seven, uh, back with our 1766 row, but for what we were doing, it was so inaccurate that I couldn't honestly tell you if we benefited from it or not. All those are planted at a 
All the soybeans we planted 140,000 seeds per acre. And that is, on all of our ground, that is the only <laughs> technically pond or washout okay. spot you'll find. Well, that's good. <laughs> Well, I mean, Kentucky, we have a lot of sinkholes, so it's uh, sometimes you end up with those even when it wasn't there last year. Oh, really? We do have a little bit of that down at my place, but it's different soil. Um, a little lighter, actually. This is probably got the best soil out of all of our ground we have. Now, this farm also got a lot of dairy mineral, mineral over the last 50 years. So how long has your family been farming on this piece of property? Uh, my grandpa bought my place in 1955. I want to say he bought this place in the 60s, early 60s. Um, grandpa left his home farm with his dad and brother. He was supposed to go to Korea, but the, he actually failed his physical to go into the, uh, the service. So they sent him back home. And he sold off all of his machinery, so he had to buy back in his own machinery and he ended up buying my place and the funny story about that is back then it was pretty common for people to loan money out to other people so how our family is connected between my my mom and dad is my dad's grandma loaned my grandma and grandpa on my mom's side the money to buy their first farm. So technically, oh. my dad's family had a hand in getting my mom's family started and maybe got us into agriculture. Oh, that's a pretty neat story. Yeah, it's. We lost a lot of stories with Grandpa. That is, um, that is the thing that I, you know, just from a tractor perspective, I feel like I want to get out there and get a lot of these tractors from the '60s and '70s because they're disappearing, and you know, I, I want to meet some of the people that actually built these tractors and talked to them because they're you know they're getting up in their 80s and things and i i look back in the tractor brochures where i get a lot of my history and information and i think well there's someone in their 30s or 40s in the 70s you know now they're 70 80 years old and it's it's good to get out there to try to actually meet the people that history is going to be gone before you know it and i've asked that about the machine or the different machines that they saw in this area back when my dad was growing up and a lot of the bigger tractors, uh, like the 5020 and, and here, if you're curious, um, this is about the best view you're going to get of our of this farm. The tree line or the fence line is there between that corn you see over, mm -hmm. just over the hill and the soybeans. Um, that's as far south as this farm goes, and it goes all the way over to the side road where you can see the telephone poles. Okay. And of course, all the way back to the buildings. So how many acres is out here altogether? This farm at one time was a square 160. My grandpa okay. ended up selling, I believe, 10 acres off. Um, for some reason, it was the lady wanted to build a house and they offered to buy it. And it was just, you hear that a lot about land back then. I mean, even nowadays, you catch people at the right time. Okay, we'll offer you, we're looking for some land and we'll offer you this much. And it was just the right time for grandpa, I guess. So. I mean, me being the young farmer, and sure. acres is acres, I'm trying to not see a reduction in them. No, it's, uh, there are only so many to go around and no more being made. Yep, that's, that's the truth. So that's, I've seen a lot of your videos where, those which are really neat, you got those older articulated. And, it's neat seeing those older tractors that somebody backed away in the shed and took care of, and then to actually see them out nowadays in good condition, and they're out there working the ground with them. Uh, it's, you know, and those tractors, I mean, I grew up in the late 70s and 80s, they were so big and so impressive, and now the new ones, you know, I saw one of your videos where you went to look at a John Deere RX at the, the, yeah. at the dealer. They're so much bigger. They they make the big tractors in the 80s just look like toys now. That's right. Because even my grandpa said that um, I demoed a 79, a John Deere 7930, and Grandpa was just we've never had anything that big on the farm before. He's like, "What are you gonna do with that?" Because we're also talking about a person that a John Deere 4020 is the biggest tractor you're ever gonna need. Right. So I mean, that was just. 
completely new to him, but don't let them fool you. Doesn't matter how young, how old they are, guys like toys. And my grandpa, when I bought that 7600 of mine, mm -hmm. my grandpa put the first 100 hours on that tractor. Very nice. Basically all I got to do is drive it around the buildings and he, uh, he worked ground down for us that year. Well, you know, it's amazing that you know, this is an 8235R and a John Deere 8640, say from 40 years ago, is roughly the same horsepower. And if you park this next to an 8640, which was the biggest tractor Deere offered at the time, this thing, this tractor is physically bigger. And this is the entry level model of the 8000s now. And yeah, for just, this year, this yeah. was the smallest 8R you could get. But it, it's plenty big. And well, it depends what you want to use it for. It's definitely weighted down for pulling, but I do feel like I'm limited on what I can put behind it. So I imagine you guys enjoyed running the 8370R a little bit when you My had it. My brother did. <laughs> Ryan was a little selfish on that one. He wouldn't let me run it. It was timing too. The we got a bunch of rain, so for how long we had it, we had to take it back. Both the 8370 with that IBT transmission, Ryan said it was just so much smoother than even running this. And this thing is, to me, extremely comfortable. No, they've, they've come a long way. I mean, I, for me, I'm always in the buddy seat right where I am now. And when I go to do older tractors, you know, people, I think one of the things they like on big tractor power is climbing up in the cab and seeing this stuff. But anything pre 1995 is going to be hard to squeeze into and Please some of the tractors I do and sometimes I got to stand out in the step to try to peer in through the window but it's there's the old capture comfort fight. was a, an afterthought for some of those machines I don't know they say I've been aware of your channel well I mean it's always on my news feed so I always drop in I like seeing the the multi machines run in the fields when you find those. Yeah, that's um, a lot of times it's hard. They, they're actually all out there together, but usually sometimes they spread out. So one's behind me and one's in front of me. And sometimes I'm just going to have to do a behind the scenes uh, shot of uh, well, that showing people or whatever. Well, that field one was a really good explanation one too. Yeah. Because that one, that was really surprised me. 11,000 acres in one chunk. Oh, well, they raise 11,000 acres of wheat, but it's only, it's like 2,800 in that one field. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. I've, I've heard of some like 10,000 acre fields up in Canada where they'll take multiple combine crews in. And, and it still take a few days to yeah. get everything covered. That is just completely out of my mind as far as how would you even begin to harvest a 10,000 acre field. Just like for us, we're small enough, you just start do the outside rounds and work in. I mean, yeah. how do you how do you do the outside rounds at ten thousand acres? Hey, um, you know, I I had a friend that went on a harvest run back in the '90s with ninety six hundreds, and he said they just started in and they went all the way around, and it took a long time to do it. Uh, in Kentucky, you know, I film in several thousand acre fields, uh, twenty eight hundred acre field, and, and one's three thousand acres. Uh, they, it's more like sections. You just take the headland off in a part of the field and work right. that out, and then start the next section. And you know, and that's one thing that I think YouTube in itself has really opened our eyes to is agriculture in different parts of the world. Because I never would have thought that Kentucky would have had the kind of fields that you find down. No, where I, you are. I grew up in Western New York, which there there are more four wheel drive tractors between. Rochester, New York, Buffalo, and Syracuse than anywhere else in the world because it rains so much. You, you really? could be on a 1,500 acre farm with four four-wheel drive tractors because they have to do tillage and they they use those tractors to, to get it done fast. But I never thought, you know, Kentucky, you think of hills and haulers and coal mining and horses and, yep. but, you yeah, know, I think the mountain ranges. I, right, that western part of the state is where the south meets the Midwest. It's um, you know, Indiana, Illinois, drop right down there along the Mississippi, and it's a lot of big open spaces. So do you see a lot, do you see many um, traditional looking farms where you see the silos and the old barn? Or you yeah, we, we don't have a lot of dairy um, on a commercial, you know, I, I, I don't film at any commercial farms, they're all family farms, but we, farms with silos in our area are Mennonite or Amish. We have a lot of Mennonite and Amish farms. 
Okay. Uh, we do have a lot of, you know, there are a lot of smaller farms, 500 acres and things that, uh, you know, people just still have in the family. But there are a lot of big family farms too that have just been very successful. And, and the big thing in our area is double crop soybeans. It's that's being able to get two crops, wheat and beans, out of the same field make a big difference in the equipment people can run and and they need to run the newer equipment because you, really you like have to run. You got to run fast. You got to get one crop off and the next one in. Well, that, like I said, that earlier that video you just posted with those was it eleven combines and. What is it, 11,000 acres they had to do in yeah. seven or eight days? Right. Yeah, I mean, they're, you've got that 10-day that ten day window like everybody else does, so you want you know each machine doing a little over 1,000 acres. And each one of those combines will do 6,000 acres a piece in a year. You know, they've got corn, soybeans, and wheat to do. And what kind of turnaround do they have? Like, as far as wearing those out, do they... Th that farm, they, they trade every year. They, so they, but that there's someone else, and every year they gets a one-year-old machine, and then that next user gets a two-year-old machine. So there, it's actually very hard in our area to find older equipment. So even, you know, I filmed at a 600-acre farm last year, and you know they had like a Class Seven combine that was maybe eight years old, because they there's just so many in the marketplace that they, they're able to work well with the dealers to kind of keep that system going and move the machines through. Really. Uh, you can see here, I saw this last one came up through here on the tractor. The two different varieties we have on this strip of corn, and I'd have to go look at the the monitor to see what we have. You can see one is definitely taller than the right. outside bass. Well, one's a little darker green and one's a little more silver. Yeah. I, I didn't even notice that until uh, I came through here. And this used to all be pasture. You guys kind of cleaned now, it out, or the soybean field up to the. You see where the the road turns to the right mm -hmm. where we took um, that from that corner down, um, basically to just to the right of that tree. Oh, all towards the end of that building down there was all pasture all the way up to here. Okay. Because we had two different pastures. One was our our main milk cow pasture and our second one here and you can see how far that one came down where that corner of that gate is this okay. whole bean field here was a pasture and that was our our dry cow pasture where we always had calves but the well all times change it, yeah and actually a funny story is my dad actually helped fence this this field in mm. for a cow pasture so i mean this used to be a field when my dad first started work with my grandpa my dad's been here for over 40 years. If I remember, did, is that spill away like a WPA project or did Ryan yes. say that went I way so. back into the 30s? Yeah, uh, I think it's date stamped almost in the 20s. Okay. And I, we almost should do a video on that again. Um, we talked to the local office and they basically said that they don't know of any that are even in any good condition and ours isn't even really damaged or cracked or anything. It's in really good condition for being as old as it is. Yeah, I have, um, I collect a lot of farm literature and that's where I get my facts and information uh, for my videos. And I have some old farm journals from the 1920s, 1919, and I think I've got one from 1921 that says, buy this silo, it has a 100 year warranty. And I would like to go see if any of those silos are still around or if the company's around to back up that warranty. So it's great to, you know, preserve some of that history on your farm. Travis, thanks uh, for the camera here. Thanks uh, for the tour of the farm and spending some time with us. And I'll uh, hopefully get back up here sometime and see some of these tractors out in the field. Yeah, that wouldn't be any problem at all. Uh, I know you said you wanted to see that 4640 run in, so. Yeah, that would be great. That wouldn't you know, be too hard. 9510 is a cool combine, too. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Well, have you ever downloaded any of those on your channel yet? I have not. And no. say, so we can be a first or something, right? That's right, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for the tour, and I hope people will check out the rest of the story on YouTube. Yeah, right. thank you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Absolutely.